Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the English Folk Dance and Song Society and to Folk Folk, uh, a series of video conversations with folk uh, talking about folk. And I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, three music artists, Cohen Braithwaite Kilcoyne, Marie Bashiru and Lady Nade. And I am Katie Spicer and I am the Chief Executive uh, and Artistic Director of the English Folk Dance and Song Society, uh, which we may refer to during the course of this conversation as EFTAS, if you're not familiar with that term. <laughs> So maybe I could start with uh, all three of you and individually um, ask you just to tell us a little bit about how you uh, got into a folk music. What, what has been your, your folk journey so far? Uh, Marie, perhaps we could start with you. Sure. Um, so I'd say my introduction, my earliest memories of folk music um, probably existed in primary school. Um, I remember... Um, learning about Kaylee and Morris dancing and also I think even just the songs that we sung I think in Brit British culture you know the vernacular of folk is in our nursery rhymes and you know kind of traditional song and so that would be my first kind of you know introduction to folk music and I would say probably really understood it more when I went to uni and actually ended up studying a little bit about it in my degree and that's when I kind of was opened up to um yeah i think just the kind of um the history and the tenets of folk music um but that was very exclusively for Brit british folk music i'd say um and also african you know american folk music bluegrass etc etc um but really i think my earliest memories um were formed from you know african folk music Mm -hmm. um, in the home and, you know, growing up in a West African household, um, that's my heritage. And so, yeah, the, the songs that would be played throughout the house, you know, the songs that would be played, you know, at social gatherings and functions and parties, um, were all very much, um, formed from, yeah, you know, Nigerian folk music and, um, what's kind of n known more now is like high life music, um, at, at the time I didn't you know you don't really kind of coin it with the genre name it's just it is what it is it's just music and that would be my first kind of like real cognitive uh association memory of, of folk music and then as I got older and started going into school and primary school and whatnot in uni it was more British folk music thank you thank you that's really that's really interesting isn't it the, the different types of music and how they just integrate into our into our world without even actually thinking about what they are not yeah. putting them in those in those genre boxes as yet you know yeah uh, lovely thank you cohen what's about you yeah so uh, a, a similar sort of story to an extent in that um in my house there was quite a broad selection of, of music played um some of it was on the folky spectrum i suppose you could say but certainly nothing Certainly no one that I would go out of my way to see now, now that I'm a sort of <laughs> hardcore English folk fan, but things like uh, the Pogues and the Levellers, that end of things, that was about as folky as, as we got. Um, but, you know, really quite eclectic music taste in the house. Um, and, yeah, likewise, I think there's always been an element of, of folk music that I've heard through things like primary school. I can remember um, particularly when I was about six years old, we had a... Uh, I'm from Birmingham and there was a Birmingham Irish duo came in and they sang, you know, traditional Irish songs um, and things like that. And, and I started playing the violin when I was six and, and that was sort of my introduction to music. And I found I was getting a lot more excited by playing Irish jigs and reels than I was by, you know, playing Mozart badly. Um, and so I, I sort of, you know, took that and followed it to its it's a uh, sort of natural conclusions. I started getting books of folk tunes and then started going to folk clubs and sessions. Um, and at that point, I suppose I was more aware of the Irish repertoire than the English. Um, but going along to folk festivals, um, you know, I came much more in contact with English music and that's, that's really where my passion is now. Mm. That's great. Thank you. And, and Lady Nade, what about you? Yeah, so growing up listening to my granddad's rock and roll mixtape, actually, and finding a Billy Holiday uh, archived under folk. So lots of her music is actually archived under folk. 
and then through listening to Billy Holiday, uh, that opened me up to listening to um, Nina Simone. And through Nina Simone, I Lilac Wine, I found Jeff Buckley. Through Jeff Buckley, Hallelujah, I found Leonard Cohen. And thus it opened me up to a lot of folk music. Um, similar uh, to Cohen and Ray going, then going on to uh, folk nights and, and singer songwriter nights. And then I started to realize that my music was more rooted in the story and lyrics hmm. um, than a specific genre. And often tried to avoid pigeonholing what I was creating. And we talked about boxes then. And then it was really, um, it, it was really when I embarked on recently the English Folk Expo mentoring scheme that I realized how I'd been influenced by listening to Leonard Cohen and Loudon Wainwright and Joan Arvin Trading and that I could see the crossover with uh, Americana and folk and um, that I, I feel like I found my home. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting, as you say, those sorts of um, connections that people make. And also, I suppose the the artificial um, labeling that, you know, goes on record labels, uh, music shops, you know, record shops, uh, radio play uh, that they they pigeonhole certain artists into certain titles, which you know, sometimes we look back and go, goodness, why why would you ever put Billie Holiday under folk? You know, that is extraordinary. But I think it's lovely that the way, as you say, that you um, you hear one thing which leads you on to another artist, which leads you on to another artist. And these, you know, these these journeys sort of go all over the place, don't they? Not necessarily just in, in one direction. I think it also, it, it already sort of touches on that thing that, you know, that definition of what is folk music, whether that's, as I say, in what is broadly called English folk music or, or folk and traditional music from, from anywhere in the world. And that actually it's an extraordinarily wide uh, canon of styles and, 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 and songs. Um, it would be fair to say, I think, that both uh, yourself, Lady Nade and Marie, you, you work across genres really you don't sort of necessarily see yourself totally as a sort of folk musician working completely with a, a, a traditional form mm. um but but cohen you very much sort of have gone down that road route of, of sort of uh you know putting putting yourself sort of quite clearly i think certainly from a public persona point of view very much into that folk box why why do you think talk to us a little bit more about about that and, and you know why your music what it is about folk that you've you've kept with it you've stayed with it and you've chosen as a musician in a sense to develop a, a musical career within within that broadly english or british isles folk genre um big question <laughs> it is a very big question there's yeah, quite a bit to unpack there um i think really it's the, the easiest answer is that it's the music that excites me the most as a sort of performer and as a, a listener. And I think over the years, what has excited me about it has changed. Um, and I think that's that's one of the reasons why it excites me is because there's so many sort of facets for me to get excited about. You know, initially, as I say, I was more into the sort of tune side of things and I was really big into, you know, playing fast, lively, instrumental tunes on the fiddle at 90 miles an hour. Um, now, that's that's very much not what I do now, really. I mean, more than anything else, I don't play the fiddle anymore. I'm a <laughs> melodian and a concertina player. Um, but, you know, playing tunes are ve as fast and as loud as possible was something that really excited me. And that was something that, you know, it's not unique to folk, but I think it can do that quite well. Um, and then when I moved more into sort of the singing and, and the song side of uh, folk music, I became really excited by songs that tell stories. Particularly, I was drawn to quite a lot of dark songs, which, again, folk music does very well. Um, and then for a while, I was drawn to songs that make sort of political statements, which is another thing that, that folk music does very well in sort of oral history. Um, and, you know, broader historical songs, like we sing songs about um, the Battle of Waterloo. You know, I, I was a big history buffer, particularly um, sixth form college. Um, and now, uh, I suppose, 
one of my big things is sort of the the quirky musical characteristics things like modal scales and unusual time signatures so yeah as i say it's it's changed quite a lot over i've been involved in folk music now for about 13 years um, so it's it's shifted quite a bit, but I think it's it's that fact that there's always something new, a new angle to 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 take it from that that's kept me interested in it and that's made me want to um, focus my career on 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 English folk music. Thank you, and and Marie, turning to you, how how are you at the moment? Um, sort of using uh, folk music or traditional music, as I say, whether that's music from the British Isles or, or wider, as you, you mentioned, sort of African or African Caribbean traditional music. How are you using that in your in your musical practice as, as a professional musician? How is that helping you or inspiring you? Yeah, I think the kind of like foundational tenet of folk music is obviously the storytelling of it. Um, and I think kind of being a song, a singer songwriter, it's enabled me to really look at, I guess, the, the purpose of the song, like, you know, using the song as not just a, um, a means to an end, but like a vehicle in which to take the listener on, like a journey to take the listener on, on a vehicle. And I think the way that, you know, folk musicians, um, you know, like, I think even during the sixties, there was like a focus of, uh, like Davy Graham, um, folk musician, he focused on like, he changed the harmonics of, of popular music, you know, and he kind of like began to tell stories differently without words, you know, through the, the orchestration of like the melody, like the way that the melody sat within a song and how actually it was the guitar that was driving the song rather than the words or, you know, like the kind of like disposal of, you know, uh, modality um and i think it's really easy kind of just to sit down and just say you want to write a catchy pop song or whatever but i think the folk music has kind of taught me to be a lot more intentional about the way that i write music um and the stories that i'm telling and actually yeah kind of looking at it and using different techniques and like experimenting more with uh instrumentation um learning even just that the fact that the banjo is an african folk instrument um, and how that has you know over the years kind of like developed and morphed into you know the five string banjo etc etc um from you know uh, Appalachian America it's really interesting to learn how you know adaptable music is when you decide to make it that um as opposed to just kind of taking it as it is and then just continuing on with that form as it's being handed to you um, so yeah, so I thought that that's probably informed the way in which I've kind of not created music that's in one specific genre, but it's inspired me to take, you know, folk, um, along with jazz, along with, you know, rock, along with kind of pop, um, and meld them together and see what, what, you know, what you can make out of that, um, and how you can tell a story in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and, and Lady Nade, what about, about you and your, your sort of, I suppose you use or inspiration from from folk music. How, how are you using that, or how has it influenced the 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 music that you've created? Yeah, I think the early listening to my granddad's mix tapes as an at an early age has influenced the mix of genres in the music that I write. Um, I think my audiences really relate to me as an Americana folk artist. Um, so it's been really wonderful to feel like I found a home and a community. And I think the fact that these uh, genres are based and pivot on the song and the lyrics and the story, that, that really means a lot to me. And it's about that story and, and community and connection. Yeah. And I, th I think interesting listening to you all as well in terms of, um, that use of the term folk and and the fact that you know particularly yourself um lady nade and marie but i think also cohen to to a certain extent you know it's you're using folk to develop your own your own voice it's it's not just a you know um just regurgitating you might say you know songs of the past or tunes of the past you're very much using it as your part of your source material to influence you but what about that 
sometimes difficulty of that word folk you know as as a genre title um you know have you have you found it a hindrance or a help or you know what what's your sort of i suppose your your view on uh, how that term is used more widely and how that uh, either engages or doesn't engage people uh, you know with, with with the genre perhaps start with with you Cohen <laughs> um wow hmm no that's that's a tr that's a really tricky one um <laughs> sorry so, about that <laughs> um i think for me the the term folk music i think i have a very clear idea in my head what it means to me mm -hmm. and i know that you know there's as many different interpretations out there as there are folkies really it's it's kind of different for everyone um i just um i suppose i i fit I feel like for most people I fit kind of quite neatly in that box because I'm, you know, playing squeeze boxes, singing m mostly traditional songs. Um, but I don't, I don't think I feel sort of restricted by that necessarily. I mean, if you, if you come to one of my solo gigs, I'm also likely to play maybe a bit of ragtime or a bit of Bach or a bit of, um, music hall you know sort of quirky things like that so i think it's um yeah it doesn't it doesn't sit badly with me or anything it uh and i don't i don't feel sort of restricted by it mm. yeah i'm not sure yeah. that, that completely answered your question <laughs> it's your it's your interpretation it's, it's completely how it how it uh how it comes across to you you know your perspective uh lady Nave, what about you again as working across genres yeah, I think, um, yeah, often perhaps being told that um, as a black female artist that, uh, you know, one must only sing sort of jazz and soul. I think it's been quite restricting at times um, and almost like, I ha like, you know, uh, as like with Billie Holiday, like she she was actually archived a lot as folk, but we know her as a jazz singer. So I think that there can be restrictions when put in a pit, then when, when pigeonholed. Um, but like I see folk as like, you know, folk means like, you know, from the German word Volk, like mu music of the people. And so it has so many different interpretations and mine of that is really just writing songs um we know that uh, traditional folk was was um shared orally and bringing people together and creating melodies that i can sing that i can have people sing with me and uh, uh connect and communicate um you know in a way that's accessible as well um because yeah, folk uh, and traditional folk is something that you, um, because of that oral connection, you don't need to necessarily play an instrument to be able to communicate. And so I think that's like really important. And I think, yeah, sometimes like, yeah, maybe pigeonhole and, and, and genre take away people's inter, inter um, uh, the way that they communicate folk. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. But what, what about you, Marie? How, what, what's your sort of perspective on, uh, you know, working with that, that genre and that word and uh, how it, as I say, comes across to a, a sort of wider public, whether it's a, a positive or a negative almost or, or neither, maybe? Yeah, I think it depends on where you are geographically. Um, if you were to say folk uh, to, you know, an American, they would include... Um, not just kind of like country music or, uh, you know, white folk music, they'd include bluegrass, they'd in mm. include, you know, um, yeah, like chain chain gang songs. They, they, it would be a lot wider in their perspective of folk. If you went to Jamaica, for example, they have their own idea of what folk music is. Um, and I think with Britain, um, it's, it's, a, it's a genre that's really assimilated to, associated with white creators. Yeah with yeah. white culture mm. um, and 
because of the fact that folk music inherently holds uh, the, I guess, the genomes of identity, when people think of folk music, when it comes to Britain, they only think of, you know, white folk music, um, which isn't really a genre, <laughs> but <laughs> like folk music is seen only by white creators, white musicians. And so it does definitely exclude anyone that doesn't fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And so for myself personally, you know, there's definitely this kind of like cognitive dissonance of saying that, you know, I, I don't make primarily folk music, but I do create a, a type of folk music. And it's like, oh, what's that? You know, what's, what's black folk music? You know, what, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and I think there's just a lot of, I think the reason for that is because obviously like the legacy of folk music in the British Isles is very, it's long and it's also very fraught, but it's one that's not actually known that very well. Mm. And so in the last, uh, you know, 200 or so years, that has changed a lot from its kind of like preliminary, you know, um, ages of, yeah, the way that folk music was kind of like very much predominantly Gaelic, Irish, England didn't really have an identity in folk music. Like we had spent a period of time trying to create that. Um, so a lot of our folk music was borrowed. And so really what happened in the last 200 years has informed the way that we perceive folk music now. Um, and yeah, and unfortunately it has been very deliberately kind of focused on what British identity is, which is, you know, which is white, which is white British. And so it does, I think, exclude a lot of people from not only, you know, I guess seeing the for the bigger picture of folk music and the way that it has evolved in, in this, you know, country, but also um, people that want to actually see themselves as a part of it. If they can't see themselves identifying with it, you know, yeah. it's not something that they're willing really to actually want to, you know, get involved with. Um, and so for me, it's like, I don't feel like slighted or um, a burden I, I guess for not being seen as a part of that vernacular. For me, I think my concern and grievance is like the untapped potential of so many, yeah. you know, folk musicians that would, you know, take to duck to water in this environment that just are, you know, historically excluded from it. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, Lady Nade, you were nodding there. Do you want to sort of come in with your thoughts on, on, on what Marie's just been saying? Yeah, no, I uh, was nodding. I just, um, yeah, just was relating to like seeing is is believing and, and and the history and yeah, just really related to your um, what you were saying there, Marie. Mm -hmm. And Cohen, you any thoughts on 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 that? In terms of that, I suppose that very sort of visual thing that Marie is talking about that you know the folk in. The British Isles, not just even in England, is, is very much seen as a sort of white genre and whether that is a is a, a, an issue and, and a how, you know, if it is an issue, how how does that sort of get broken down? How does that how does it become that really inclusive thing that that folk wants to be, likes to be a, a come one, come all sort of idea? Yeah, sure. So for me, it's. Um... I don't know, it was never a particularly, something that I ever really thought about really. I think part of it was because I became really excited by folk music when I was, you know, still primary school age and, and threw myself into the scene when I was maybe 10, 11 years old. And I think you don't, well, speaking personally, that sort of racial baggage, it doesn't, you're almost not aware of it at that age, or I wasn't really. And in fact, one of the only things that at that point um, was, Almost the opposite. It was my mom, who is um, she's born in Britain, but she's from a, a Belgian family. Um, almost, almost in a joking way, saying, "Why do you want to get involved in that old white people music?" <laughs> um, you know. So it was, it wasn't the scene um, excluding me. It was, it was my mom going, "Why would you want to do that?" Um, you know, I I'd, personally, I've never felt anything aside from the odd exception, other than. Um, great welcomeness from the folk scene and I think part of that is because I'm doing sort of quite trad stuff and mm. it's you know immediately acceptable people can see where I'm coming from mm. um, yeah I, that's 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 my experience I suppose that's that's really that's really interesting because I think as, as well isn't it it's 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 very much the sort of um, 
the older generations, you know, who have been very loyal to to folk music, uh, traditional music in the British Isles through its, you know, its historic ups and downs over the last sort of 20, 30, 40 odd years when it's gone in favour and out favour. They're always so excited by young people really getting into it, particularly as yeah. you as you say, particularly if you're really getting into the into the trad end, even if gradually you you know you mm. find your own uh, language within it, but the trad end. And so I think I think they they are very much sort of like yes, lovely young people <laughs> doing our Absolutely. traditional music. It's you know the thing that we are passionate about is uh, I, I think is very is very true. Um, um, just coming back to Marie, maybe I might touch on um, the work you've just been doing um, with your creative bursary that uh, you had from from EFTAS, because that's been specifically sort of looking for that uh, that, that sort of black voice almost within within British folk. Do you want to just you know that you I've read your 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 fantastic sort of thesis virtually, isn't it? Um, so there's a huge amount of of, of information and, and detail in there, but I don't know whether you can sort of perhaps um, just highlight the, the 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 main things that came out of your research for you and, and perhaps you know the things that have sparked uh, interest to maybe do further research whether that's uh, academic more research or, or how that's going to play into your music yeah so when i embarked upon you know the research i had an idea of this is probably what i'm going to find and this is what i'm going to talk about um, and what i ended up getting was completely unexpected um ended up picking up a book from the Vaughan Williams library um at Cecil Sharp house um in the midst of lockdown not two or four five six seven lockdown but when I could get a chance to go into the building and I just so happened to stumble across this book called Blackface Minstrelsy in Britain and so I've heard of Blackface Minstrelsy most people have um but this was obviously quite specific to its existence in in Britain um, and really what that took me down, it took me down a road of complete revelation that this was actually a complete phenomenon um, in Britain during, you know, from 1830s really to the 1960s, um, almost a century and a half. And I think learning about the, the impact of um, this phenomenon, not just the American counterpart, which is what a lot of people are more familiar with, um, it was how specifically adapted to Britain and um, that it became that it completely changed you know the the landscape of this country and so really it became pop culture in you know similar ways in which rock and roll became pop culture punk became pop culture blackface minstrelsy dominated um you know Edwardian and Victorian um periods and so seeing the way that the American, so it was introduced to this country, to the British Isles via American um, blackface minstrelsy. And that was actually a form of, uh, of uh, African-American folk music that had been adapted to what they call, you know, white mountain folk. And then they, that kind of like morphed into blackface minstrelsy in America. That came over here and then we adapted that. Um, and that was adapted during a time of, you know, first it was during the kind of like colonial era where it was very much that was what was being propagated um, to kind of like just before post abolitionism um, movement started to take hold. And yeah, it was this form of folk music that was repurposed mm. into, you know, um, yeah, you see it in, in music hall as well. Um, it was repurposed to basically be the, the music of the people. Um, but unfortunately, it was a type of music that was, you know, very um, yeah, it was extremely racist. The vernacular was extremely racist. And so that kind of like the music and the content became one in the same. And as I started to research more, I, I realized that, you know, there's a really good reason why there aren't that many black people that exist within the folk music canon in, in this country. Um, and it's because it was, it was weaponized against them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so because of this, you know, very long, significant period of time um, that existed um, with this form of music that is very much, you know, yeah, the means of which to, you know, demean and to um, disparage, um, you know, people of colour. Um, and that includes Asians as well, because, you know, during that time, black was a kind of umbrella term for anyone that yeah. wasn't really white. 
Um, and so seeing the impact of that, the legacy of that has continued because it's never actually really been addressed. Like it was kind of, you know, let's just, it was a bit like, let's just burn all the slave ships, let's pretend it never happened. Let's kind of get rid of the evidence. And we'll talk about it kind of like lightly, but the, the problem with that is that, you know, we've never really made the connection, I think, between um, blackface minstrelsy, its ad adaption of folk music um, within British, the British Isles, and actually its legacy now today and the way in which people, it's like, you know, if you've excluded, if you've kind of created this kind of, um, this environment, you know, it was a hostile environment. You know, the UK was a hostile environment to people that were not white at that time. And obviously it's still today, in many ways it still is. But when you've created that, it's kind of like, you know, the legacy of ex excluding um, women from playing the piano, from learning how to play the piano, you know, and how that was like eventually evolved to, okay, you can play it in the home, but you can't play it in public. Like when you have that really extended period of time of like limitation mm -hmm. and exclusion, it affects like generationally that is still seen, you know, and it takes a long time for that to kind of be rebalanced. And the problem is, is that that's never really been actively tried to be rebalanced, yeah. you know? Yes. Um, yes. So it's really interesting. And, and, you know, once you go down that rabbit hole, I end up going down the rabbit hole of, you know, other forgotten forms of, you know, I guess areas of history when it comes to like folk music and the, the impact of empire and folk music in mm -hmm. other countries and Jamaica being one of them, um, you know, former colony and mento music being this mother of all genres of, you know, Jamaican music and that being, you know, almost extinct now because really it was not, it was never carried on. It was never passed down the way that folk music needs to be for it to continue to live on. Mm -hmm. um, but just the impact of folk music and the way that it carries identity um, inside and outside the British Isles in correlation to the empire, empire rule, has been really fascinating. Mm. It's it's a really interesting study you, you've been doing. And as you say, it, it throws up all, all sorts of sort of questions and uh, and so forth. And, and as you say, that issue of identity and and folk traditions or, or, or traditional music traditional dance storytelling all of that is is so fierce and i would i would say you know certainly from the perspectives of of uh, eftus and working with as i say the so-called english genre it's it's sort of um we have this slightly i suppose difficult or bizarre scenario where you know we almost struggle um to convince people uh, in England of, you know, this identity that you can associate with folk traditions, which we see much more clearly from Scotland and Ireland, certainly. And I think, uh, you know, in more recent years, perhaps a resurgence of that in, in Wales. Um, so I think that's really interesting then with, you know, as you then layer it and say, that's us talking about how, how do we engage a multicultural population in in something that is rooted in identity um, when the identity of folk music even for you might say white British people is not that strong certainly as I say in comparison to uh, our neighbours in Scotland and Ireland but I, I completely agree with you it's, it's that thing of, of how do you unpack all this? How do you actually deal with it? How do you not just brush it under the carpet sort of thing, as you say, like, you know, the black and white minstrel show, which sadly I would show my age, but I remember as a child, you know, watching on television, Saturday nights, you know, BBC, prime time, big program, and just gradually it fades out, really. It just fades out and, and nobody talks about it sort of anymore. But, you know, I think that is, that, that's very interesting, that lack of really actually dealing with with uh, with certain issues or certain assumptions and just letting them disappear but then that means as you say that they take decades generations before they perhaps find their way through almost isn't it um lady nave what 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 what's your, your sort of your thoughts are on on that and that those sort of issues around identity and and folk arts and cultures and different races and you know and so forth yeah i i had probably not realized the importance of the history of folk music until the black lives matter movement this summer and everything 
kind of fell in place in my mind and it dawned on me that sea shanties sung and written by sailors that well may have been uh on crew uh, on slave ships um been on crew on slave ships it blew my mind to visualize it um but yeah i don't claim to know a lot about uh uh, folk history, but I'm just starting to embark on this journey and discovery and I'm really keen to learn and find out more and yeah, and I guess I, I relate to it not being sort of um, maybe accessible or available, you know, um, in my education, I didn't learn about um, lots of stuff and I've just had, yeah, I've just had a successful um, funding bid to take some time out to research the influence um, folk um, music had um, and, and, and its place in history and uh, I know Marie mentioned the banjo and Rihanna and Giddens has written about in her work and um, and research so yeah I'm I, and I have my platforms and I want to use them in like a positive way and so yeah I'm really excited about um, going on a on a journey of research I might have to give you a call Marie <laughs> yeah like, I do definitely love to you need it to ask I'm not an expert but yeah I can tell you what I know <laughs> and and for you Cohen does that sort of those issues um, that sort of wider issue of as, as I was saying you know it, it certainly feels from an England perspective that the the Scots and the Irish particularly have a a greater handle on that relationship between their traditional music, dance and so forth and, and their identity and that sort of seems to give them a great deal more strength and it appears to give in in England. Have, have you found that or is that you you, you know do, do you feel that in, in uh, when you you perform or when you you talk to people about your your music or folk music in general? Yeah and even going back to my earliest introduction to folk music that was celtic inspired musical you know irish traditional music i wasn't aware really at all until i started going to folk events that england really had folk music other than <laughs> you know green sleeves that the ice cream van played you know it's, um it, i just wasn't really aware of of english folk music as a thing and i think a lot of english people are, are the same and i think yeah a big part of it is um the sort of English um, nationalism and, and sort of patriotism is seen as a sort of a well largely as a sort of an, an abhorrent thing by a lot of people you know it doesn't fit comfortably with them whereas it's much more um, sort of acceptable and, and almost no, the norm in um, in Celtic countries in, in Scotland and Ireland and, and Wales as you say to have that sort of national pride and to have your traditional music and your traditional arts very much at, at the centre of that um so yeah i think that's that's definitely um something that's very true but for me i don't think my enthusiasm with english music necessarily well i don't know it's, it's quite hard to unpick i don't think i like it because it's english yeah. but I, I don't know if it is a coincidence that i'm english and i like english music i don't know <laughs> um and it's e even even outside of folk music, I do I do find my my other big passion is is baroque music and medieval music, and I do find I tend to listen to more English composers than say German or French composers. Yeah. Um, so, I suspect it isn't a coincidence, <laughs> you know, when it's it's across two quite different um, genres. Um, but yeah, I think for me, um, part of the th part, one of the things with folk music is that nationalism of any sort and patriotism it, it doesn't quite sit well with me but mm. sort of moving it the step down to uh something that people call localism that 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 doesn't sit nastily with me so looking yeah. for as i say i'm from birmingham and I, I went through a phase of being really excited about sort of west midlands traditions and i think that you know is a bit more accessible for people saying these are songs these are dances that were done by people that lived in in your village or somewhere 10 miles down the road i think that's certainly sits more comfortably with me than here's something that's that's english and you should be proud of it because it's english and, and you're english i think that's a that's a very very good point and i think that's also a very interesting point about that localism there has been um in, in all sorts of sort of sectors within 
the wider sort of heritage and culture or sectors, industries in the last few years, a lot of talk about that sense of place and, and, and giving people that sense of place regardless of what their ancestry may have been or whether you know they are very recent migrants from anywhere in the world. Um, but that being that place is the thing that we can all potentially share in. You know, we all live in that place and we can all take an interest in, in, the, in the history of that place, but also bringing it right up to date into who is now currently living in that place, as I say. And I think, I think that's, that's a really interesting, interesting point. And, and certainly, as you say, you know, it's that you want people to be um, engaged with as I say, whatever is called their, their traditional music, but you don't want it definitely to go down that nationalistic because then we come back to, you know, what Maria was talking about is that that music is only for a certain group of people. And so that defeats the whole whole object, doesn't it? So, um, Maria, would you... To what you were saying, yeah, I think what, what you were saying, Cohen, is really, like, key because I think even just the term localism, like how that works... You know, when you think about culture and you think about locality and community, it's about ownership. And like when it comes to, you know, your local community, everyone owns everything. You know, there isn't like one person that owns like, you know, the whole the whole pie. It's like everything is shared. Everything has everyone has an active contribution to that locality. Um, and the problem with nationalism um, and that kind of like patriotism is that it only belongs to a certain number of people or a certain type of person. Um, and I think that's really where folk music fr like thrives, where actually it's the it's the voice of the people, it's the music of the people, and everybody is actively um, welcome to contribute to that song. You know, um, whether it be con listening, participating, writing it, making it, sharing it. Um, but I think if we can all operate at that level of <laughs> like localism, but national localism, maybe. <laughs> Can be the new thing, yeah. But I think that that is probably where it thrives the most. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. So, so perhaps just to sort of a, a final thought from you all to to wrap up this really interesting discussion that we've been having is on that sort of note. Um, how how do we as a as a wider sector or you as individual uh, artists practitioners creatives uh go about engaging a wider cohort of of people in what we broadly consider to be folk music and as i say whether that's whatever is described as english folk music or it's the folk music of of, of the british Isles or it's all the myriad of you know folk music traditional music that is is practiced by by people both professionally but on an amateur basis you might say on a community level throughout the entire country because of you know obviously centuries of of migration and the influence of of uh, of cultures coming from all over of the world on on the cultures you know that we sort of vaguely consider indigenous to, to England what what do you what do you think are, are you know collectively we can do and uh, and individually what you can do perhaps perhaps start with with Lady Nade there yeah I think well I'm going to keep writing songs <laughs> uh -huh. and keep singing because music brings people together and it helps to foster relationships and a community and without community um, that music doesn't get passed on. And so the way that we create um, uh, accessible experiences for everyone is to have conversations like this, um, to uh, uh, create and share our music, to leave behind our oral um, messages um, so that they're accessible like through, through vocal and music. Great, and Cohen? Um, so, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> <laughs> it was really as, a, as both as a, as a wider sort of sector, music, folk music sector, but also as, as individual artists, how, how do we go about or how should we continue to try and go about engaging more people in, in, in these traditional musics, as I say, whether it be 
predominantly the music from England or the wide British Isles, but also all those different uh, traditional musics and, and dance and so forth that's, that's being practiced by all the different communities that, you know, we have in, in, in the British Isles. Sure. So I think, um, I think to, to think about is, you know, focusing on what, what it is about folk music, that, what folk music does that perhaps other genres don't do or what you know what folk music does that, that it does better than other things um and i think one of the the great things about folk music and one of the things that really attracted to me 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 to folk music as a scene is that real sense of sort of community and that real sense of involvement and i personally i felt that folk music does that better than other scenes you know with things like um open folk clubs and and sessions you know going along to a, a session and there being you know 30 people there that you've never met before and you spend three hours playing tunes with them i mm -hmm. think that's that's an amazing thing you know i don't really do much anymore because uh one of the cruel ironies of being a full-time musician is that music as a hobby just loses its appeal um but i think that one of the things that, that folk music does really well is that sort of communal music making that sort of hands-on thing um so i think yeah that's something that i think could be sort of driven home to to mm. sort of entice people into the folk scene mm. and marie what, what what thoughts do you have i think um yeah i think what everyone has said has been really key and i would add to that making i think the stories sharing more diverse stories within the canon of folk i think there are a lot of stories that haven't been told or shared you know as widely as they we you know should have um and it, you know like she was saying like you know representation it it does it is powerful and mm. there's always going to be you know per hundred one person who decides to kind of connect and interact with that thing regardless but for the majority you know, they want, I feel like it needs to be something that, yeah, that people can kind of really relate to. Um, and I think because it's such a quite a traditional practice with instruments that aren't really in the kind of like popular music vernacular now, people feel even more kind of far removed from, from it. But I think like she, he was saying, Cohen was saying, it's the community of folk music is really powerful. Um, and obviously what drives that are the stories, you know, that come from it, that come through it that make make it up and I think yeah hearing more about the history of folk music I think in this country and you know the kind of innovators of folk music you know um like Davy Graham for example mm -hmm. you know half Scottish half um Caribbean can't remember the Caribbean island but you know he completely he was part of the 60s folk revival and he introduced the dad gad tuning into the music vernacular you know plus many other things and I think recognizing that folk music isn't exclusively one culture, but it is inexplicably a combination of many different cultures that have all borrowed from each other just because of the nature of human migration. And I think being a lot more kind of, um, yeah, transparent and vocal about that aspect of folk music, I think would cause people to be a bit more curious about it and engaging with it and yeah, get involved. Hmm that's it isn't it it's get involved it's get involved well thank you all very much so uh, a huge thank you to lady nade cohen braithwaite kilcoyne and maria bashiro thank you